My name is Daniel, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Hibernia, and it is my joy to serve here in this church. And I know many of you share that same joy with me to serve here as well. It's also my joy tonight to be preaching here to you, and so I'm excited to open the text tonight. I've been assigned the text Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 through 28. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I want you to grab that now and turn there to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 through 28. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. If you need that version, it is likely under one of the chairs nearby you. You can grab that now. Pastor Scott, last week, he covered the first 22 verses of Hebrews chapter 9. And like he said, this chapter really emphasizes that Christ, as the high priest, has achieved eternal redemption for his people by shedding his own blood. And as we saw last week, Christ only had to do this once for all time. This is great news. So my goal for us tonight is to draw out of this text that is before us, what is the main idea here? What is the author of Hebrews trying to tell us so plainly? Well, I've written down what I believe it is, and it's this, if you want to write it down as well. It's Christ's sacrifice paid sin's penalty once for all, and he will return to bring eternal salvation. I'll say that again. It's Christ's sacrifice paid sin's penalty once for all, and he will return to bring eternal salvation. If you're a note taker, I do encourage you to write down that main idea and underline the words that say once for all. When we start reading the text here in just a moment, I want you to look for where you're going to hear that language again, once for all, and then underline that as well in your Bible. With that, I want us to begin reading. So would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is the word of God. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your word and what it means Lord, help us to draw out of the text exactly what it means tonight so we would walk away with a fresh understanding, God, of who you are and the sacrifice that you offered on our behalf. Father, we love you and we give you praise. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I read a peculiar story earlier this week in preparation for this sermon and it's about a woman. Her name is Sarah Winchester. She's famously associated with the Winchester Mystery House. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. It's a massive mansion in San Jose, California. Uh, Sarah was married to a man by the name of William Winchester. He was the heir to the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, which manufactured the famous Winchester rifle known as the gun that won the West. Well, the Winchester's life was marked by great sorrow. 
1866, their infant daughter, Annie, died from marasmus, a very severe form of malnutrition. And this was a devastating loss that was compounded in 1881 when William, Sarah's husband, died of tuberculosis, leaving Sarah a very wealthy widow. Well, following her husband's death, Sarah inherited a massive fortune and a 50% stake in the Winchester Company, which generated for her a very substantial income. Well, the legend goes like this, that Sarah sought the advice of a spiritist, a medium, who told her that her family was cursed by the spirits of those that were killed by the Winchester rifle. Well, the medium reportedly advised her to move out west and build a house for herself and the spirits, warning her that she would die if construction ever stopped. Well, in 1884, Sarah moved to California and she purchased an eight-room farmhouse and she immediately began this extensive and continuous construction project that lasted until her death in 1922. The Winchester Mystery House grew into a seven-story mansion with an estimated 160 rooms, including 40 bedrooms, two ballrooms, 47 fireplaces, 17 chimneys, and over 10,000 windows. I would like to know who is cleaning this house. The house is known for its peculiar design, featuring staircases that led to ceilings, doors opening onto blank walls, and windows overlooking other rooms. And many people believe that these oddities were intended to confuse and to appease the spirits that Sarah so greatly feared. Well, Sarah Winchester, she passed away in her sleep on September 5th, 1922, and by then the mansion became this sprawling maze that reflected her troubled mind and her grief. Today, that house stands as more than just a tourist attraction. It stands as a silent witness to the fear of death that keeps millions of people in bondage every single day. However, this is what we know. Because Jesus Christ, the sinless Savior, Son of God, died on a cross and rose again, our fear of death can be transformed into hope when we trust Him as our personal Savior. That's the best way to face our inevitable appointment with death. I read this to one of our pastors yesterday, Brian McNair. I love the way that this man's mind thinks. Love you, brother. He said this. He says, it's interesting, Daniel, after you reading that story, this is what's coming to my mind. He says, Jesus died and he went to build a mansion, but this lady built a mansion and then she went and died. I love the way that brother thinks. <laughs> There's a quote that I, I read it. I don't know who wrote it, but I couldn't find the author. But whoever said it said this, Our lives are often filled with pain and death looms just ahead, but Jesus' cross can bring us peace and take away that dread. We know this, death awaits all of us. But praise God for the superior sacrifice of Christ that gives us a hope for eternity with him. All throughout the book of Hebrews, we've been seeing how Christ is superior. We've been, we've been seeing how Christ is superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses. He's the superior priest to all other priests. And what we've been learning about just recently is that Christ's priestly ministry is also superior. And tonight, we're going to build on a lot of what we learned last week, that Christ's sacrifice is superior. We're going to work our way through three claims tonight that the author of Hebrews has here in the text. And that first claim that we're going to make from the text tonight is this. Christ is the better sacrifice. The author writes this. I'll read it again. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 
Now, depending on the translation that you are using tonight, yours might start verse 23 with the word, therefore. And you may have heard this saying before as it comes to studying the Bible. Whenever you see the word therefore, you should ask the question, what is the therefore, therefore? So, really, what is the author trying to say here? What is he referring to by saying, thus or therefore well what i believe he's doing is he's drawing a conclusion from the previous section in verses 11 through 22 that christ had to die to purify us for our sin it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with blood because as we read last week in hebrews 9:22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now inside the tabernacle, you had all the copies of the heavenly things. These copies were purely symbolic representations of the true heavenly tabernacle. We read several weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, where it says this, They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Now the vessels in the tabernacle, they were only the copies. And even they, the copies had to be purified with sacrificial blood. But the heavenly things, they needed to be purified by a better sacrifice. Christ is that better sacrifice. Now, if you're looking at your text, you may be wondering why is that word sacrifices, where it says better sacrifices, pluralized? I thought it was just one sacrifice by Christ. When you would be right, one commentator wrote it this way. He said, the phrase better sacrifices refer to the blood of Christ. The reason for the plural sacrifices is its connection to the plural Greek word to tois, meaning these, which is a generic plural. So it's still one sacrifice of Christ, and it was better than the animal sacrifices. In the automotive industry, uh, prototypes are often built to test and refine new car models. And these prototypes, they undergo rigorous testing and adjustments and modifications. And once the prototype is perfected, the final production model is made, incorporating all of its improvements and using the best materials, resulting in a superior and finished product. Now, this illustration I'm using here is not incredibly airtight, but the point that I want to make from this is that the earthly sanctuary and its rituals were like prototypes. They were necessary for understanding our sinfulness and preparation for the final sacrifice to come. Jesus' sacrifice is the culmination of God's redemptive plan, offering a superior and sufficient purification that the prototypes could only ever hint at. Now, to be clear... The priests of the Old Testament had to enter an earthly tabernacle to offer their sacrifices, but not Jesus. You see, as we saw here in verse 24, Jesus did not enter an earthly tabernacle made with hands. Rather, he entered into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. The high priest modeled this as well. According to Leviticus 16, the high priest would annually appear on Israel's behalf on the Day of Atonement. But again, here's what we're seeing. We're seeing that Christ's sacrifice is better. Jesus entered into the presence of God. Not an earthly copy of the heavenly reality. Now, did he do this because heaven was defiled and Christ had to go to heaven to purify it? Absolutely not. It's because you and I are defiled. Jesus did not come to save purified people. 
He came to save defiled people. Jesus said in Luke chapter 5, verses 31 through 32, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I want to zoom in here real quick on what verse 24 is saying. I'm going to read it again. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now watch this. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. The way that we need to understand this text of why Christ had to offer his sacrifice in heaven is because sinful beings, us, will be there. Christ cleanses us for heaven. Only the better sacrifice of Christ was sufficient enough for this. Which leads me to the second claim that is apparent here in our text. The first claim was that Christ is the better sacrifice. The second claim we see here is that Christ is the all-sufficient sacrifice. Christ only had to die once. His sacrifice was sufficient to only need to take place one time. It's important that we belabor this point tonight. You're going to hear me say it over and over again, but this is central to the Christian faith. Verses 25 through 26 help clarify this claim, and so I want to read it again. Verse 25, Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, I want us to remember something here for a minute. Let's remember who is Hebrews written to. Well, we believe this, that the author was writing to Jewish Christians. The author knew that his recipients would understand what he's talking about here from a very personal sense. The Levitical system was still in operation at the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews. So, the author is reminding these Jewish Christians of the insufficiency of the temple sacrifices because they had to be offered year after year after year. He's reminding them of this to contrast with how Christ only had to suffer once for all. I can almost imagine there had to be conversations from one priest to the next, like, brother, aren't you tired of having to do this year after year after year? I mean, come on. But these sacrifices, they were meant to make them anticipate the day when Christ would appear once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. One time. That was all it took. If Christ had followed the pattern of the Levitical priest, he would still to this day be needing to offer his own sacrifice. Well, the way the author of Hebrews puts it is not only would he need to have been still offering that same sacrifice today, but since the foundation of the world. But Christ doesn't need to do that because his once-for-all sacrifice was sufficient to pay the penalty that our sin owed for past, present, and future saints. In many team sports, uh, when a team is struggling, they'll often look to their best player to sub into the game and change the whole course of the game. And this player is often seen to the team as the team's savior, able to do what others on the team could not do. Jesus is our perfect substitute. Where the old covenant sacrifices were insufficient and had to be repeated, Jesus' one sacrifice was perfect and complete, forever changing our standing before God. I'll tell you, sometimes I cannot stand it when I go to the movie theater 
and I'm watching the previews, and on comes a preview for a movie where they're intending to excite me about remaking what I believe is a wonderful classic. And I'm like, why? Why are you doing this to me? I love this movie. Don't ruin it for me. Christ's sacrifice is so great that it does not need to be repeated. Neither for all the redeemed from the foundation of the world, nor for all those in the future. It is sufficient. That's how powerful it is. The death of Jesus never needs to be redone because it is so perfect that it cannot be improved upon. Its impact is so profound that it continues year after year, achieving its purpose of saving sinners and presenting them righteous before God. I love this. Here in verse 26, Jesus tells us that he has put away our sin. If you're a believer in this room tonight, that brings you great comfort. Your sins have been dealt with. One of the things I love to do, is I, I, as we all should, is we love to interpret Scripture with Scripture. So I want to I further illustrate this point with some other verses that really drive home this idea that Christ has put away your sins once and for all. Micah 7, 19 says, You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Isaiah 38, 17, For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Jeremiah 31, 34, For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Isaiah 1, 18, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Psalm 103, verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. One more. Colossians 2, 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Church, that is the good news. That's the gospel. We needed a better, all-sufficient sacrifice that could put away our sin once for all. Now look, Scripture is clear. All of us have sinned in this room. There hasn't probably been a past 30 minutes in our lives that we haven't sinned. And we all fall short of the glory of God because of that. The wages of sin is death. Death is what we have earned in this lifetime. But right here in Hebrews 9, 26, we are reminded that it's been put away by Christ's sacrifice. What's required of us is that we turn from our sin and we trust in Christ for our salvation. His sacrifice is sufficient to pay the penalty that your sin requires. Now when Christ returns, though, for his second coming, he's not coming to put away sin. He's not coming to bear the sins of many. You see, he's already done that. His purpose will be far different. He will return to bring eternal salvation. And that's going to be the third claim that the author Hebrews is making here tonight in this text. Christ will return to bring eternal salvation. One more time, I want to read these verses again for context. Verse 27. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. People are appointed once to die, and then we are judged. Christ was offered as a sacrifice once, and then will come a second time to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. You know, this appointment is not one that we are going to miss. Whenever I have a dentist appointment, I would prefer to miss those. Now, I don't, but I certainly wish I could. Death is appointed to all of us. Unless, of course, Jesus comes back tonight. But that does not change the reality of death being inevitable. 
To die once is the general rule for all people. Now, there are a couple of rare exceptions we see in the scriptures, like Lazarus dying twice. There's a comedian, his name's John Christ. He tells a joke about this from Lazarus' perspective. He says, imagine Lazarus in his mansion up in heaven decorating his room. He just got there about four days ago. Then he gets a knock on his door. (coughs) Yeah, um, sorry. Look, we don't normally do this, but we're going to need to send you back. (laughs) Back to the Middle East where there's no air conditioning. Let's go. Come on. (laughs) But again, this is a rare, miraculous act that Jesus performed that displayed his power. Another exception was the examples of those who didn't even die once, like Enoch and Elijah. Put me on the Enoch plan, am I right? Aside from these exceptions, the general rule still stands. It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. This singular verse refutes the heretical ideology of reincarnation. You don't die, then come back as another person or as a cheetah. You die, and then you are judged. You die, but then you are conscious later. I read this silly story from an old Our Daily Bread devotional. Anybody read Our Daily Bread ever? Yep. This is an old one, March 10th, 2000. (laughs) Yeah. I was digging deep, all right? (laughs) It says this, a page in the 365 stupidest things ever said calendar had this amazing quote. If you bought our course... How to Fly in Six Easy Lessons, we apologize for any inconvenience caused by our failure to include the last chapter, How to Land Your Plane Safely. Send us your name and address and we will send you the last chapter post-haste. Requests by estates will be honored. I really can't imagine a pilot taking off in a plane without knowing how to land it. But then, crazier things than that have happened in our world, right? I can't imagine, though, that some people are flying through life without thinking about where they're headed and what will happen immediately after they die. They're like a college student who wrote, I don't think about things until they happen. Death is still a long way away. No matter what our age, we need to be thinking about the end of our life now. Paul emphasized the urgency of this when he wrote, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We don't know when our appointed time will be. I can tell you, it's already been scheduled though. We also don't know when Jesus is coming back. Revelation 22 tells us he is coming back and he's coming back soon so today is the day of salvation when jesus comes back he is going to complete our salvation for those of us who are already saved we are saved but our salvation is not complete yet you could think of salvation in the past in the present and also in the future It's past in the sense that it looks back to when Christ shed his blood for us. It is present because we are saved and united with him now. And it's future because it points forward to the promise of Christ returning to deliver us from this broken world and into his presence where we will experience eternal freedom from sin. I want to close tonight with this story of a really... um, hard and almost devastating conversation I had several months ago with a very troubled high school student who claimed to be an atheist. I was sharing the gospel with him, and he was vehemently 
against any conversation about the Lord. And when I think about this young man, my heart is crushed for him. And I'm praying even for him to one day be saved. He said this to me before I never saw him again. There is no Savior. There is no hell. And even if there was, I don't care if I'm going there. This young man, like many others, share this same sentiment. But here's the truth. They're wrong. You should care if you're on your way to hell this night. Because just as surely as there is a heaven, there is also the very present reality of eternal torment in a place called hell. But what I want you to see is that there is a Savior, and his name is Jesus. He is the sinless Savior, Son of God, who the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 2. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know this. Our days are numbered. And as Moses would have us know in Psalm 90, teach us to number our days, O Lord, that we might get a heart of wisdom. If you have not trusted in the better and all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord, I am pleading with you tonight in the same way I pleaded with that young man that day. Be reconciled to God. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, you cause blind eyes to see. You cause deaf ears to hear. I pray through the proclamation of your gospel truth that you sent Jesus Christ your one and only son, to this earth to live the life that we could never live, to die the death that we deserve, and then rise from the dead three days later, paying the penalty that our sin deserves, proving your power over our sin and over death. I pray by the power of that same gospel, would you cause blind eyes to see? Would you cause deaf ears to hear even tonight? Lord, if there is even just one person in this room tonight, who needs to repent of their sin and trust in the better and all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ, would they do that tonight? We love you, Lord. We praise your holy name. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.